it's exactly 36 minutes past the hour and you're right on time for youth and politics today it's a big day of course to all of us and i know you are at home relaxed cool calm and collected but right here 244 we want to extend the best for you today is international youth day how did we get all here let's take a look on 12th of august was designated International Youth Day by the United Nations General Assembly in 1999. That was the first one. And 20 years down the line, we have seen tremendous growth in how the youth and their affairs are looked at in the international arena. Of course, we'll be looking at some of these, and of course, the theme of this year's International Youth International Day is transforming education. I don't know how much we have fared, but we'll be looking in details, of course, with my guest. Today, I'm joined by two young men, Grayson Marwa. You're the program officer, Siasa Place, and of course, the chairperson of G Activate. Karibu sana. Thank you. Nice to have you Asante. here. Asante. And of course, here with the guy with the suit, you know, with the blue suit. Nice to have you, man. He's Shadrach Omondi, a student at KSL, Kenya. School of Law. Yes, I usually, you know, Kuna Vanya Lazimo Mvalia. Karibu ni sana, anyway. It's nice to have you guys. Asante. We're talking about International Youth Day. What do you think entertainers are quoting to when you hear International Youth Day? Uh, first of all, happy International Youth Day to all the youth out there. And I think this is a very good day for us to celebrate what young people have been able to achieve over the past one year. And uh, each year the theme keeps on changing. Last mm -hmm. year we were talking about safe spaces for youth. Yes. This year we are talking about transforming education. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, good, it's a good event and it's been running throughout the week to try and see what young people are, are, are doing in as much as education is concerned. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope we've had enough deliberations yes. as we end, uh, end the celebrations today. Definitely. Yes. We'll be coming to that because I mentioned something about last year. What do you think about International Youth Day? I think International Youth Day is a day when uh, the youth uh, take cognizance of the strides and steps they have taken yes. as far as development is concerned. And most importantly, their participation as so far as uh, social, economic and political issues are concerned. All right, let's do this. And of course, you at home can also keep interacting with us at Y254 channel. And of course, even on our Facebook page, it's not that big issue. You can also interact with us. It's at Y254. Coming to you, Grayson, you've mentioned about last year's theme. Do you think we created enough space for young people in the environment, working environment? Uh, I would say it's very funny that we discussed about safe spaces a week to the International Youth Day. But all along, we've been having spaces that are not, are not good for young people. Yes. But I think after the, the, the theme last Last year and the discussions and the events that we had, mm -hmm. we are trying to create environments that are good for young people to engage. And I believe one of these space is where we can give young people a platform to talk about the issues freely yes. and especially address them with their leaders. So I think we we on the right track, though not there fully, because the youth voice is always uh, looked down upon. Vijana are considered to be rowdy people, noisy people. They cannot bring substantial mm -hmm. things to the table, and also there's the mentality that. We are, we are guns for hire. We cannot say anything from our own mindset. So we are still struggling, but I can say also that there's some, there's some, there's some effort. Do you think we have reached a place that we can say at least we are in growth as parties? Yeah, yeah, we have. We have reached. We have really because, made because the youth voice is now being taken into consideration. I'll give an example like the BBI team yes. had an opportunity to listen to what the young people were, were presenting to mm -hmm. them. So that means that the government and even the leaders are now realizing that young people are a very important demographic that you can't wish away and you need to listen to them. Right. Yes. Uh, you, of course, a student. Yes. Do you think the bodies that are in schools can really initiate so much in terms of growth? Yeah, I think uh, we the, the, the need and uh, some of the initiatives we've seen, like for example, when we look at uh, students' in, involvement uh, in politics at, at school, yes. we'll, we see the, the democratic process through mm -hmm. which uh, students elect their leaders, and we also see in, uh, the kind of uh, in, uh, the way they are informed and the way they articulate the issues. Mm -hmm. yes. So at least we are making some good progress. At least. We're All right. So now I want us to get straight to this year's theme, transforming education. We have made quite a long, a long journey with ups and downs as a country, of course, mm -hmm. looking back from the t colonial times when people used to go to school because they were prominent families and they were wealthy families, narrowing it down all the way coming to today, when we're talking about free primary education and secondary education to some institutions, of course. Do you think we have really grown to a level like we can say university needs to be free? <laughs> <laughs> 
I think though it would be a political statement uh -huh. because we are still grappling with even making primary political and statement. Yes, <laughs> we are still even grappling with making uh, primary and secondary school free mm -hmm. because I know there are schools that kids can't go to school because of maybe fifty shillings, hundred shillings, mm -hmm. or even just lunch. And so I think, in as much as we'd want to to go that way, the first thing to ensure that what is already there is strengthened. We have good systems working for primary mm -hmm. education, for secondary education. Then now we can focus on making university better. Mm -hmm. But as of now, I can also say that the previous governments, like the one that introduced uh, free secondary education, yes. that was a good move mm -hmm. because a lot of young people could not access education now can access it. And I think we just need to strengthen it and ensure that there are systems working. You right. find schools going for months without money from the government, yet mm -hmm. there are monies that have been allocated. Mm -hmm. But just transferring the monies from the national government to the schools to ensure that learning takes place mm -hmm. has been a challenge. So how can we ensure that these systems that have been put in place work? so that the young people of this country do not suffer. You, you prompted me to mention something about the CBC, but we'll be coming and, of course, having a look at that because yes. it's really engaging as far it is. But before we come to the CBC, this year's theme, of course, entails a number of things. I just want to mention two, inclusive, inclusive and accessible for all youths. That is education. Yes. Do you think right now the system that we've been using, us, the one that we did 844, was really inclusive? Yes, I, I think it was inclusive because... <coughs> Uh, for example, we have uh, affirmative action. Like, mm -hmm. for instance, the the way that the, the, the boy child and the girl child transist from class eight to form one is mm -hmm. different. Like, the marks are always lowered for, for the girl child. So I think that is <laughs> inclusivity and uh, even in terms how, of how, affirmative how, action. How, how, how true is that? Uh, that is the truth. Because uh, look at it also from uh, the transition from form four to mm -hmm. university. The, the marks for the girl child is always lower as an affirmative uh, action. And then when you also look at uh, the disability, people with living with disabilities, yes, yes. like we have a lot of schools, uh, for the special schools for people living with disability. So for me, I think it is inclusive. And then mm -hmm. th there's not that element of uh, discrimination. Yes. Pro provided you can perform well, mm -hmm. you can access. All right, the point of accessibility, because we are looking at some of the institutions or rather the, the schools that are in rural areas, mm -hmm. they've not managed, of course, to get some of these th things, the basic things that students here in Nairobi or other counties around the capital, they get. Mm -hmm. Do you think we've really managed in terms of accessibility for education? Accessibility, I would say no, because you find that uh, the curriculum is the same uh, across the country, but the way that students access education in different areas varies. Yes. Like there are places that are given I can, I can say the environment is very conducive for mm -hmm. them to learn, mm -hmm. but in some it's hard. So you find like you can't compare a student who goes to a boarding school in Nairobi with a day school somewhere in, in Isiolo or, or in Marsabit. Yes. Then the, the, there's not that accessibility for all, yet the curriculum is the same, mm -hmm. but the environment, or just for the environment, it's not, it's not fair for all. Right. For all. Okay, b b before pro we proceed, there's a clip I'd like us to listen to. Honorable Raila Odinga was making a mention of, uh, he's, he's, the, he's the AU representative for infrastructure, mm -hmm. and he was making a mention, I don't know whether that clip is, re is ready right now, so as we can have a look at it. He was mentioning, of course, about what some of the things that we need to be doing. I don't want to think about infrastructure before we go to the clip. Okay, let's first of all listen in. High representative for infrastructure development in Africa Take it was on Friday at the UNAP headquarters in Nigeria as Kenya joined the world in marking the International Youth Week. It's here where Odinga warned African countries that youth unemployment was a ticking bomb that can only be diffused through extensive education reforms. If the youth are left completely unattended to and educated without skills, then they become a drug on the society. They become drug addicts, delinquents, and criminals. But if they are empowered with proper skills, then they become a proper force for wealth creation in a society. He said Africa must create an environment where employers and education providers work closely to design curriculum that meets business needs. Education means much. The industry remains a big challenge. While there are more educated young people looking for work, employers say they cannot find the skills they need. The labor market is suffering from this significant skills mismatch. The annual week-long conference that ended on Friday was organized to take stock of strides made in empowering the youth. Today, Kenya joins the world in marking the International Youth Day. All right, um, that's the speech that was given by Honorable Raila Odinga. Of course, on Friday last week, 
and he was making a mention of the, some of the things that we need to do in terms of infrastructure growth. Mm -hmm. Do you think we have really made a growth in terms of the infrastructure development? Uh, infrastructure in general, I would say we are, we are, we are trying as a country. Though some of the, the things that are happening are political. <laughs> because if we find at the end of the day when a road is being launched, uh -huh. it's not to help the people or they don't really want to launch that road. Uh -huh. But they are doing it to gain some something from it. Mm -hmm. But when you look at things like uh, like electricity, I would, I would, I would, I would really applaud mm -hmm. because even the remote parts of this country have electricity now. You look at things like schools. Most schools are getting, are getting the basic things that they need. Mm -hmm. But then we still have a lot to do, especially when it comes to things like uh, ensuring ensuring that uh, there is a good road system in yes. cities, like in Nairobi, people mm -hmm. suffering a lot because of traffic jam. We need a lot of planning. We need a lot of planning around the infrastructure. But when we're talking about infrastructure growth, I'm trying to look at some of the cities that we are really, really looking at, like Konza City. We have Tatu City and some others, of course, that are re really upcoming. Mm -hmm. Do you think young people have been given the opportunity to grow in all these cities? Uh, I, I don't think young people have been given uh, the opportunity because, first of all, uh, for, for you to claim that a young person has been given an opportunity, mm -hmm. they have first of all to be empowered. Yes. And then we talk about unemployment. Mm -hmm. So do you think we have solved anything? I, I think we are trying to solve. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are not yet there. So, But so still we are making our own efforts yes. in our own ways. So more need to be done. <laughs> <laughs> more needs to be done. Yes. All right, that's a good statement, of course, when you hear young people saying more needs to be done, you yes. know, they're usually aggressive, like, mm -hmm. we need to do so much, <laughs> you know, sure. but that's good. Mm -hmm. Of course, we are moving on forward, looking at the competency-based curriculum and focusing on Kenya, despite ups and downs in the education sector, we have seen several advancements from the Corona times, and as I had earlier on mentioned. According to an economic survey, this is what I want to listen in, mm -hmm. 2019, released by Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, expansion of university had, universities rather had seen 81 universities open between 2014 and 2017. And it stood at 168 universities, but 57 oh. universities were shut down after they became casualties of tough exam management rules released by the education CS back then. 57 universities closed down. The question is, why did we create all these universities in the beginning? Because you find that the few that are there, if there were 10 and they have been strengthened to operate, they right. would have operated. But the upside that you've talked about between 2014 and 2019, 2017, 2017 yes. where a lot of universities were being opened, I don't think the intention was to ensure that higher education is available to, to, to most young people. It was an issue that each and every region, each and every county, each and every community needed a university. Actually, it because was, it was I, the aim of the government to have 47 universities. I, I, I would not agree with that. I would really fault that move because how do you want to have 47 when the few that are 10 or are 9 are, are really struggling to operate? Yes. Universities are, are in debt. Universities are in problems. A lot of students are in these universities. The number of lecturer ratio to, 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 to students yes. is very high. You mm -hmm. find one lecturer has to handle around 200, 300 students. Mm -hmm. How many students would understand what the lecturer is talking about? So the issue should have been first strengthening these universities that are there. Then now after we are very much comfortable with all this, then we can move ahead and open very many new universities. You are prompted me to probably to come to this question about the CS for Education, Professor George Magoha. Of course, did mention the other day that all lecturers must be professors. <laughs> What's your take? Uh, <laughs> I think that would be a good thing if all lecturers were to be professors because then the expertise and the experience uh, they would uh, send it, give it back to the students. But then the question is, where we are going? Where are we going to get the professors from? <laughs> Where are we going to get them? Yes. The question actually is still even for me remains to be like, and I'm going to ask this to you. Mm. Do we really, or rather, can we really manage to get all the professors on board in you know, our universities before even the merger comes in? It's, it's possible. The only thing is text. It has to take time. The problem I have with this government of ours is that someone just wakes up one morning and says, we want full professors within. It cannot be possible within a day or within a month. Mm -hmm. We need to let it be a process that is gradual and within time we are going to achieve it. As he said, it's a good thing, but we need to plan properly, we need to strategize, and we need to know how do we want to go about it. Do you think we are failing in planning? Because implement implementation for education seems very easy, but planning seems to be failing. What do you think? Planning is the problem because we don't seem to be talking the same language. You look at the fight between uh, KNUT and TSC, for 
for example, mm -hmm. it's a fight that tells you these people are not reading from the same page. Right. We want the same thing, we want the curriculum, for example, but we are not we are not talking, we are not discussing. The minister, this year, would come today and say we want to do ABCD, but he has not consulted the stakeholders. So the issue of consultation and planning together is the problem that is facing the education industry. And once that is done, I think we'll not be having these problems that we are seeing industrial action every now and then. Because yes. even now, as we go to the third term for high school and primary schools, you'd see teachers strike. It's yes, not that they like striking, but it's because the Teacher Service Commission does not talk to them, the Ministry for Education does not talk to them, and so they feel if you can't listen to us, hey, let's down our tools. Are teachers justified to strike? They are. Me have only supported all their, their strikes because they usually have a reason to strike. Last year they striked, or they went on strike because there were issues with their pay, there were issues with their job, job, job groups, appraisals mm -hmm. and yes, things yes. like that. Salary this, deductions. Salaries, even yes. this time, they're justified to go. If you listen to Wilson's so own talk, he's talking about issues that are happening with teachers across this country. But the thing is, the TSC is not listening. And if people cannot talk, then it's the one inch, it's the young people who are going to suffer. I, I don't know whether you, you are affected like I was by the strikes that uh, usually happen during the third term, because usually paralyzes the, the examination period yes. and the examination time. Yeah. What, what are some of the things that we need, we need to probably bring on board so as to deal for once and for all with these strikes that usually... I think like my friend has said, I mm -hmm. think uh, the, the first thing is that we need to talk. And then secondly, we need to have some honesty. Mm -hmm. Like for example, when teachers uh, agree that they have a CBA with their employer, the yes, TSC, yes. then we need to have some, have some honesty in, uh, on how to implement it. You see, when we say this today and then behind the boardroom somebody comes with another proposal, I think that it is mostly disagreements between teachers and their employers that always cause this trouble. And the, at, at the end of it all, you see, it's always the students that are affected. So, uh, I want us to go straight to the CBC. And in 2017, Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development designed a new system of education famously known as competency-based curriculum that was later on in the year launched by the Ministry of Education. Probably for you at home, it's the 26333, or rather 26333. Of course, this is what it entails. Two years pre-primary education, six years primary education, three years junior secondary education. I know for us, we, we cannot even relate to what this is, yes, you know. Yes. <laughs> three years senior secondary education, and of course, three years higher education. I don't want to raise my concerns on this. I want us to agree on this particular thing. Mm -hmm. Do you think we are doing the right thing to bring this on board? It is the right thing. It is the right thing, and it's the right time for us to move right. that way. My only concern is how it's being rolled out. It's being forced on some people's throats. Their people don't, don't agree with it. And the people who don't agree with it are key stakeholders in the education sector. And so if you have someone who is, who is an implementer of the system, for example, a teacher telling you, I do not understand what CBC is, then you should, you should question yourself and go back to the drawing table and say, yes, we want to launch this thing. Can we have all of you on board and discuss it? One, two, three. Uh, there's something you mentioned. Yes. That teachers are key stakeholders, but they say they don't know. Yes. Let me bring you on board about something that I was doing a research on. Mm. Uh, by April this year, the government began training 91 1,320 mm -hmm. teachers of the CBC, that is. Mm -hmm. And of course, another bunch went through the same, is actually going through the same right now in August, mm -hmm. to that, of course, it will amount to 228,000 teachers. How can we say that they don't know about this competency? I'm not, I'm not sure about the total number of teachers in this country, uh, vis a -vis the 200 that are going to be yes. trained. But the thing is, if you hear uh, a leader of a union saying that our teachers are not ready, just to be sure that this process is going to face a very, very, very big uphill. What thing. is being ready? Being ready is people need to understand what it is, people need to agree with it, and the teachers that are being trained, yes, it's a good number, it's a significant number, but listen to their bosses, listen to their representatives, listen to not listen to Kupet, what they are saying, they don't feel like the teachers have been prepared enough for the rollout of this CBC. You know, well, well, probably let me bring you on about this issue. We usually say that change is inevitable, yeah. and change at times can be really, really hard. Yes. Do you think we are fighting between a people or rather a group that is like, <laughs> We don't want this change, and still we have another group that is the government that is saying we need this change. Yeah, you said change is good, and I will also say that uh, change is good because, uh, <coughs> for example, when we had we brought the 844 system, we needed to do what we call uh, some research and analysis. Has it really achieved what it was intended to achieve? Then it meant that we needed to do some improvement. Mm -hmm. So when we are doing improvements, we need to change some of these things. And then when somebody claims that uh, they are not aware. Uh, yet uh, they are key stakeholders, then it brings a very uh, fundamental question. You see, talking as a lawyer, our constitution at Article 10 mm -hmm. provides for public participation. Mm -hmm. Now, we have the parents, we have the students, and we have teachers and the government. Mm -hmm. Parent claims we are not involved, 
teachers claim you're not involved, then it, it rolls back to the government. Why are they forcing this on the people? Let me ask, uh, Grayson. Yes. We're talking about key stakeholders' yes. involvement. Here we're talking about people not being involved. How many people can today stand and say that they were not involved in this? Because they sat down and agreed on the competency-based curriculum. <laughs> uh, it, it only needs one person. It only needs the boss who speaks for the teachers to say, we don't want CBC and that will be the end of it. And that's why you've been seeing them fighting. Nat, Nat has a position it has taken. I do not speak for them, but I think their position is they were not consulted and they were not involved fully. And that way they are, they are, they are really hampering, hampering this process. Mm -hmm. And even next week there's a conference on uh, CBC that is yes. going to happen at uh, Kenyatta University. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to see what comes out of that conference because I think now the ministry is trying to bring together all stakeholders to discuss this issue. But as of <coughs> now, this issue is being discussed by KICD and the Ministry of Education and a few teachers, the 90,000, the 200,000 who are being trained. Are we late for this? We're not late. Mm -hmm. This conference that I think they have organized would be a good place to go and sit and listen to what happens. Mm -hmm. And I'll be following to see what, what, what these teachers now will say after this, this engagement. Because as is mentioned, you cannot do anything without engaging the stakeholders. Definitely. It will be futile. And, and of course, also looking at the, the, the strike that was announced last week, not rather they said they've given some few days mm -hmm. before they reopen. And they've said that according to Wilson, that they will give, they've given an ultimatum of several days before they stage a strike. I think the strike, the strike they're talking about is an issue between uh, NAT and, and TSC. TSC yes. They're having issues with uh, job promotions, they're yes. having issues with teachers' deployment. Job deductions. Job, uh, deductions so, salary. Salary. Yes, salary deductions. <laughs> deductions by, uh, by TSC mm -hmm. to, 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 to from the teachers. Mm -hmm. And you see, I think like that there should have been a meeting to discuss this. But we've been, if, if I've been following, and most meetings that NAT goes with the TSC, mm -hmm. they end up without a solution. People go there with a hard stance and they say if it's not my way it's no way mm -hmm. so i think even nat and tc need to to reconsider and go to these mm -hmm. meetings with an open mind with an open heart to go and sit down and discuss the issues and see how to get a solution but if they continue the way they are on left and right we are not going to move uh that takes me back to the year 2013 mm -hmm. and uh we had quite it was like we have solved the issue in 2013 after the long extended strike and it was like we everything is now cool mm -hmm. do you think we have an issue between the government agreeing with the tsc and the nat I think uh, there's a problem because uh, uh, the teacher seems to be reading from a different script. You see, uh, TSC is uh, like a, a branch of government, so like part of government. Mm -hmm. So they should be speaking the same language. The only problem is that uh, the uh, not they're claiming that they were not involved. You see, um, on Friday I had an opportunity to attend the International Youth Week mm -hmm. at the UN. Yes, Gigiri. Gigiri, yes. And uh, one of the directors from the institute, uh, curriculum institute, was there, and they asked the question: How many people? Uh, know about the the new CBC. Almost the whole hall, nobody was aware. So it points to a very big issue of public participation. And, and Mark, you, this, these were the finest brains of young people across this country yes, who are sitting at the UN. Conference. But if they tell you they do not know about CBC, mm -hmm. it points to an issue even about how are they sensitizing the general public yes. about CBC. How are they doing campaigns for even the local Monaichi Mashinani to understand what CBC means. We cannot be talking about it in boardrooms at KICD, but the people who you intend to implement this thing on are not involved. It's wrong and it's not going to work. Let me say this, I've not gone for any class to be taught about the company's diverse curriculum, but I know something. Mm -hmm. yes. Do you think it's a personal initiative to get to learn about the CBC? I understand this. The have first, you, first and foremost, have you sat anywhere to be taught about it? No, I have not. I have but read you know about, about it. it. You have read about I, it. I have read about it. Can we call it, it a personal initiative? It, to some extent. Uh -huh. There is a point that it gets to a, to a personal initiative, mm -hmm. but there is now the responsibility of the people intending to implement it, to right. go ahead and do it. I'll give an example of the census. I know what the census is, but every day in the dailies there is a page that has the census sure. thing and they will tell you it's on August 24th. Yes, we know, but they are still reminding people that on that day we are going to do that activity. It's high time the ministry and KICD came up and sensitized the public, taught the public about CBC, let people understand. Even if it's media interviews, even if it's newspaper adverts, even if it's the chiefs going to tell the people, curriculum in mm -hmm. let people understand what it is. Who is failing in all this? I think uh, the, the buck stops with the government. <laughs> like you said, there's need for a lot of uh, intensive civic education. Uh -huh and to maybe tell the parents. Because, for instance, uh, one of the issues uh, about this CBC is that uh, parents are going to take a very leading initiative. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, taking pictures of students when they come back home, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> helping them do, do, doing assignments, uh -huh. taking them through their tablets. How will somebody do with not even a computer literate from the village, for instance, and a text right. at all? Right. From that point, let's merge these two together and come 
probably probably try and agree on this. We're talking today about international youth day, it's, and the theme is transforming education. And now Kenya is bringing, on of course, the transforming education theme seeks to bring new systems that include the 21st century youth. Do you think the CBC education system is bringing inclusivity and accessibility of education? Yes, it is. It's a good curriculum. It's something that I would vouch for at any point, and we need to, to, to run away with it and right. see if it's implemented. And I know right now there are a few schools that are already doing the, the first two, the two six, they are doing the pre-primary. Mm -hmm. pre mm -hmm. And it's a good thing because we're giving young people an opportunity to choose what they want to do. If they want to do art, if they want to do music, they go yes. with it from a young age. It's a good thing. We have res I have reservations about how it's being implemented and right. how it's being sold to us, but it's a good thing. It so will, it exactly, will. we are looking at what will be happening in the next few years. Yes. Do you think it will affect the current uh, students in high school? Uh, I don't think negatively it, that is. I don't think there will be any negative uh, uh, impact because these ones are to transit to university. Mm -hmm. Then th those ones in primary. I think the way it, it is rolled out, it is uh, face by face. So okay. there will be no major impact. We are bringing in a new system, of course, as we had earlier on said. Mm. What failed in the previous system that now we need to bring in the new system? The previous system was, uh, as of I course, said, the one that we all of us did. Yes, I yeah. said of uh, it's it's book centered. It's about yes. exams. Mm -hmm. You are being taught about exams. Being taught about exams. Nothing else. All right. And so we we churn out students who are generally very good in books, but out here the the, the society the environment is not book friendly. The environment he, out here is street friendly. If you are street wise smart, you are good to go. But if you are book wise smart. Very few people would, would excel on that line. And so the system was made to a way that we are forcing people to read things. And there are very many things that we learned ourselves even here today mm -hmm. that have never and will never help us. But we were forced to read them, <laughs> be good at them, <laughs> get good grades at them. But hey, you what is this going to help anyway. you? What, what is it going to help you out here? Uh -huh. So I think this new curriculum, because it comes in with the aspect of you doing what you you love doing, mm -hmm. it's going to improve the way the way the education system is going to be in this country. And of course, it mentioned, yes, yes, please. Uh, just to answer the, the same Mm -hmm. For me, I think uh, the, 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 this curriculum, it was not that bad. Mm -hmm. It was good to some extent because, for example, for example where I was in high school, mm -hmm. uh, we did uh, things to do with uh, drawing and design. In your school? Yes. When was that? Uh, just 2012. All right. These, these are select schools. You know, these are schools are the, and yes. then they are schools. They are schools. <laughs> so, right. so, so I think it also depended on uh, the accessibility, the equation we're talking about. Mm -hmm. That some schools, they, need, they had uh, things like electricity, yeah. they had metal works, yes. they had woodworks, they had art and, and, art and craft. Some schools also had home science, where even boys yes, would train as chefs. Mm -hmm. So I think it also uh, depended on accessibility. And so le let's look at uh, Kenya uh, as a whole. Mm -hmm. Most of us are products of th that system. Yes. Have we all failed? That's a good question. Have we all failed? We haven't. We so haven't. at least we are going somewhere. We are good. Yes. So are we stable exactly with where we are? We are. And why no. then do we have to change the system? Because we have a higher percentage of people who are not comfortable with the system. According to you, do you think it will change anything, the new system? It will. In terms of skills? It will. Because now you will not be forced to read about chemistry if you don't love chemistry. <laughs> you will not be forced to, to, be a mathema to read about mathematics if you just want to be an artist. It's no longer compulsory. It's no lo it will be about what you are good at. That's why they're calling it competency-based. So m most most scholars are saying that uh, countries that have developed, mm -hmm. uh, they they take most of their time to enhance skills mm -hmm. of their young population. Countries like Malaysia, countries like China and and Singapore. So, therefore, I think Kenya is also just rallying on uh, what uh, developed countries have done. Mm -hmm. so that's why we are going for skills. So at least we are going somewhere with skills. Mm -hmm. Do you think right now the eight four system has failed in terms of providing young people with enough skills? It has, especially in the universities. It has, because now universities, it's even worse, because there it's about exams, it's, it's nothing else. Unless you are an, an extra student, you'd now go and get an extra skill before you graduate and have an extra skill from, from there. But if you're that student of Kitabu na Kitabu, you'll just get the, the 844, and that is it. Do you think the market is ready to accommodate us, as by Jesus, the, from the 844 system? Because some have really exact in their lives, some have, some have really taught and failed. And still you have degree holders who are saying, I'm jobless. Let him go first. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a, there was a uh, survey done by Ipsos. Uh -huh. uh, you would find that uh, uh, something which we do here, our high school students are doing, mm -hmm. when you take it to South Africa, it will go to university. The, yes. their, high, their high school students can't do it. Mm -hmm. So that tells you that our, our education system was one of the best. So I don't think, because we have, even this skill program, some people will still fail. So we don't say that the whole system has failed. 
So you will first live in your skills. Even these skills, some people still <laughs> fail. So <laughs> we, you asked your question about uh, the market. Uh -huh. The market in Kenya is looking for skills, but we yeah. are not offering skills to our students in schools. And so when you get out, you are being asked, what can you do best? Mm -hmm. You will find a young person grappling answering that question. But the thing is, they have the papers already. They will tell you, I have this, I have this, I have this. But the skills bit is missing. So the market needs also to understand mm -hmm. that what we are producing in 844 is not what you want out here. Mm -hmm. And that's why we find very many young people out there struggling getting a job because when you go to the job market, they want skills. They don't want the papers. We are talking about an open, an open space for last year. And yet here we're talking about transforming education, bringing them together. Are we really, as a country, because we have the CBC that is coming in, do you think the CBC will transform education to give a better space than it was initially? It will, because now you're given a choice to choose what you want from a very young age. If you want to be an artist, you start learning that from, from, this, from, mm -hmm. from pre primary yes. I assume. And so as we grow up, we're going to have a space that artists have their own space, musicians have their own space. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a, a chemistry student, you, you have your own space. I see. It's going to be, to be clear from, from the onset, I, I, I believe. What do you think? I don't know why he has a problem with chemistry. But <laughs> <laughs> See, chemistry was one of those uh, very good subjects. But then the, the <laughs> I know that people are watching like, why? <laughs> to, 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 to respond to the, the same question. Yes. Um, you see, I always wonder why employers seem not to realize that mm -hmm. they have a role to play in, in terms of skills. Mm -hmm. Like when you were uh, first brought here, you need to be inducted in what is, is to be done here. And you can't have that kind of induction without the knowledge. So I think some people have neglected their responsibility. But then to offer a solution, I think uh, we needed to have had some a kind of I internship, what the government has done, where we have a lot of internship programs. Mm -hmm. So uh, then you they also need to be told that they need to volunteer most of the time, especially immediately you are from campus. You need to volunteer and get these skills yourself. So we are lucky experience because of people who don't want to volunteer? Yes, some people don't want to volunteer because maybe it doesn't pay. Mm -hmm. And then when they take it to the job, they also ask for the skills which they claim to don't, uh, not be having. Do you think the government by itself is supporting education as much as it is? It is. Uh, he's mentioned about internships. I think right now the government is really trying yes. to offer internship opportunities mm -hmm. to young people. But then also you look at the budgetary allocations that are given to the Ministry of Education. It's mm -hmm. quite something. Maybe we need to do an analysis if they're getting enough. But I believe the government has the goodwill to ensure that we have, we have good systems working for education. Let me, uh -huh. Yes, yes. Uh, probably just to, to say something about, about the, the, the allocation. The CS for Treasury read, this year we're reading the financial year. 2019-2020 when he's releasing gave 97.7 billion shillings to support university education and 12.6 billion for help loan. Do you think 12.6 will be enough for all the students? Good figures there. The question would be maybe we need to analyze what is the demand versus what has been offered by, by the government. Yes. But help is one of the things that I think out loud the government has helped a lot of us out here mm -hmm. to get education. Mm -hmm. But then there is the issue of, um, I was talking to a friend the other day and they were talking about the fines that you get. If you default even for two, three two days, days. If, you are, if, you are, if you are employed, for example, they will mm -hmm. still fine you. So we need to have a discussion around it. But I think the allocations are good in as much as ensuring that education is available for people at the basic level. Okay, pro just just to, to, to come on board, mm. do you think help loans, or rather, do you think the students are aggressive towards getting the help loans? Yes, students are aggressive. Uh -huh. You just need to go to any campus immediately when people open, to mm -hmm. the cyber cafes around. People are applying for help. Mm -hmm. And I think help should also be extended. For example, to where I am at Kenya School of Law. Yes. We need, uh, I think uh, the already there's an agreement for help to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, help is a good thing. And in fact, what the government needs to do is to increase it further. All right. Yes. Let's go straight to white collar jobs. That's an issue that is really emerging all over, not only in Kenya, but of course in the entire world. Mm -hmm. We are leaving the university with the mentality of I want a white collar job because I'm learned. Do you think we, uh, the marketplace right now is ready to accommodate everyone who is intending to get a white collar job? We should push the market to, <laughs> to accommodate everyone who wants a white collar right. job. I feel bad when people who are in white collar jobs tell us to go and become uh, to job help our community, Suko Mashinani, that word job creators, I hate it. Because the person who is telling you this themselves, mm -hmm. they have never been a job creator. They've always benefited from the system. Uh, Why do we want to benefit from the system, mm -hmm. but we don't want the system mm -hmm. to, to, to let other people benefit from it? Because, you know, getting employment is one thing that we should not even be discussing. It is a right for young people. And when they were writing the constitution, they were very clear in 43 that you need to get access to jobs or mm -hmm. employment as a young person. Right. And so if, 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 if the government does not want to give us jobs, they want us to create jobs, mm -hmm. then they need to provide an environment for us to create jobs. Right. It's not easy to create jobs, no matter how smart you have a plan, no matter how much money you have, 
it's not easy even to start that small business. Okay. Uh, let, 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 me, let me mention something. Uh, when we're talking about white co collar jobs, that is, we're also having another issue that has really emerged. I want a well-paying job. I'm done with the university. I straight away want a, a well-paying job. Do you think that's possible right now? <coughs> I think the, the, the answer is yes and no. First of all, uh, let me also take it from where I left. Mm -hmm. Our constitution at Article 55. Uh, Article 55. Yes, yes. contemplates that uh, Parliament should legislate a law mm -hmm. to ensure that youth, among other things, have access to jobs right. and employment. So you see, this is, this, it means this is a, a government function. It knows that this is a function. That's why the government has come up with several programs like the AJIRA. The government has uh, um, concepts like a white box where you, you put your ideas and you are given loans. The government has things like uh, the National Youth Enterprise Funds and mm -hmm. the Ways of Funds. Mm -hmm. It means the government knows very well that that is a function that it, it should be ensuring. Yes. But uh, to go back to your question, it is yes and no because uh, <laughs> now they have said it, it depends on your luck. <laughs> <laughs> depends on your luck, yes. not on your skills? Not on your skills. Yeah. Because uh, sometimes you find people with uh, well-paying jobs, they, they don't have those papers, mm -hmm. but people with real papers, like uh, the other time, uh, the issue of Kevin Ochin, they can't access those jobs. All right, unfortunately we are out of time. But before we call it a day and before we wrap up, I want to give you guys 30 seconds each. What can you tell young people today's International Youth Day? Where do we begin? I think <laughs> I'll go first. All right, so, so. <laughs> I, I think uh, first of all is to wish all the youths uh, outside there a uh, very happy International Youth Day. Mm -hmm. We've had a whole week celebrating and uh, uh, ad advise, uh, having a conversion as, as youths. Mm -hmm. um, I was also privileged to attend uh, the Youth Week at uh, University of Nairobi, Taifa Hall. Mm -hmm. And one of those things that came out clearly is the issue of uh, civic education, sensitizing the youth. Like, for example, you are a musician and you don't know how to earn royalties from your music. Like, for example, you have a concept and you, you sell, you give it to somebody and then they take it away. Yes. Without really having you getting money from it. So th the issue is uh -huh. the youth need to sit down, the youth need to organize, the youth need to mobilize and to sensitize themselves yes. to be relevant. Great. Let me have 30 seconds only, can you? We are the highest percentage in this country and so if anything is to happen, mm -hmm. it has to happen with us and we have to push for it. So my challenge for the young people out there is that let's let's push for what we want to happen. Yes. And we, let's not even think about pushing it from Nairobi. Let's push it from our counties. The devolved units are there to help us get services. Mm -hmm. And so if you can push for something to happen in your county, good. Grayson and Shadrach, many thanks for making it here at Y254. That has been Youth and Politics looking at International Youth Day. We call it a day. Papers, Jenny, Tungod's Education, Entrepreneurship Tuesday. Val is coming in just a few. Don't go anywhere. <laughs>